this is Dr. Lisa Rodriguez bringing you your week two guidance for EDU 629. This week we'll be exploring the topics of the hidden curriculum and culturally proficient instruction. You'll read about a town that's divided in ways not immediately apparent on the surface, but deep and significant in regard to cultures and social justice. You'll read about one student, Josue, who represents countless English language learners with very similar educational experiences. After reading the detailed observations of the ELL shadower, you'll think about how Josue, or other students like him, can be better served by their teachers and their schools. You'll think about what's missing, what's present that may be detrimental, and what you could do to help Josue become academically successful and even enjoy himself in the process. Who is Josue? The first job of the teacher should be to find out the answer to this question. This is the essence of the learner-centered classroom. Effective teaching is not just lobbing instructional content at students all at once, hoping that some will catch it. Effective instruction that meets all students' needs requires differentiation. It means getting to know our students and building positive relationships with them. In regard to the observations about Josue, I have some reservations about the author's many assumptions, that he was thinking about soccer, that he was trying to make himself smaller, that he was hoping that the words would become clearer and other things. The author stated, Josue seemed to prefer to work on his own. It was as if Josue had been trained to be silent and compliant. This is on page 17 in paragraph 4. This may have been the case, but unless the author is a mind reader, it's not a given. According to Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, Josue may have just been an intrapersonal learner, a person who prefers to reflect quietly, alone, when presented with new content. For the most part, though, I agree with the author's assessment of Josue's educational experiences as being deficient and failing to meet his needs. I just want to point out that even the material presented here should be considered critically. Don't assume something's true or accurate just because it's printed in one of our books, or just because I say it. Question it. Think about what, it, what makes sense to you. In Chapter 2 of Culturally Proficient Instruction, A Guide for People Who Teach, You'll read about a town and how it's strongly divided culturally, even though many of the inhabitants have lived there for many years. Think about your own town or city. Does it have very different sides of the tracks? Think about the people that live in your town or city. Are all people treated equally? Do they have equal representation in the community or city government? Do people feel comfortable to walk around, go shopping, eat, or play in all areas of your town? If not, who feels uncomfortable where? Are students treated differently in schools based on their race, language, religion, gender, or disability? The town of Woodburn, where my school is, literally has two sides of the tracks. The railroad tracks don't actually divide the areas, but the different parts of the city are very obvious. A fellow teacher once told me she didn't go to Front Street by herself because she was afraid. Mostly Hispanic people are on Front Street, and it may have helped if she spoke Spanish. I'm white and I feel just fine on Front Street. Hispanic people living there appear to be comfortable shopping at the Woodburn Company stores, which is on the other side of the freeway. Maybe it's because it's right off the 5 freeway. It's a common spot for everybody. But they might not be very comfortable strolling through the streets of Tukwila, which is the housing track that's built on the golf course. And they might be a bit ill at ease around the senior estates. One thing that, uh, an incident that happened that, that definitely made Front Street more attractive to, to everybody was that President Obama visited Luis's Taqueria there and had lunch when he was running for office. So that was really exciting and, and that made Front Street famous there. Really though, I'm mostly so proud of our schools. There's only one high school, which is composed of, comprised of four smaller schools inside it, two middle schools and four elementary schools. All of them have strong dual language programs. Native English speakers and native Spanish or Russian speakers alike are learning in two languages. They're also developing precious multicultural social skills. In addition to Hispanic, white, and Russian students, we have some Muslim and some Somalian students. We have a very diverse mixture of religions. Our students are integrated from kinder on, so there are very few incidents of racial violence or even bickering. The older students I'm still in contact with have friends from all different cultures. I love it so much, it's the main reason I've been willing to drive 100 miles daily to teach there for the past 14 years. Culturally Proficient Instruction 
<clears throat> the culturally proficient instructor uses learners' diverse experiences, perspectives, and learning styles to create a teaching and learning environment that is respectful of each learner and encourages positive social interaction and active engagement in learning and self-motivation. That is by Nuri Robbins, Lindsay, Lindsay and Terrell in our textbook on page 29. There are many barriers to culturally proficient instruction. Remember that these barriers do not only concern ethnic groups, but other groups as well, age, gender, sexual orientation, religion, language, disabilities, and others. Um, after this recording, um, I'm presenting a little clip that demonstrates how attitudes and stereotypes are often reinforced in the media, including the things that children watch. So there's a little clip of some Disney videos that, that show this. The hidden curriculum. Hero's, Hero contended that although it would be impossible to purge the curriculum of its hidden elements, he insisted that it could be offset by encouraging critical awareness and involving students in the construction of meaning. He asserted that it is necessary for students to be active subjects in the classroom rather than simply recipient objects. <clears throat> Again, it's important to remember that the hidden curriculum does not only pertain to ethnic groups. It influences all cultural groups, such as religions, gender, sexual orientation, age, special needs, etc. A, a PowerPoint that I'm including in this guidance discusses the hidden curriculum in the context of special education and students with autism. The author of the presentation describes how the hidden curriculum includes unspoken cues such as gestures, tone of voice, body language, common social norms, etc., that students with autism may have difficulty with. However, English language learners, especially those who have immigrated from a very different place and culture, may have many of the same difficulties, as well as um, problems understanding idioms. Students notice, consciously or unconsciously, if teachers' actions contradict their words. As our text pointed out, mission statements are empty words if not acted out consistently in real life. Here's a contradiction that I have seen in schools. Guns, of course, are not allowed in school. Students are immediately expelled if they bring a gun to school. They are the biggest, worst no-no of all. And yet, during rainy day recess, when the kids sit on the library floor to watch Looney Tune cartoons, they see cartoon characters blowing each other's heads off with guns and rifles. Sometimes the characters are smoking cigars while they do it. The point is, we need to be conscious of our words and actions, our biases, gestures, behaviors, facial expressions, and tone of voice. We need to be very reflective in order to be genuine. I hope you've enjoyed this, this guidance. If you'd like it in text form, I'm including a PDF of this, and I look forward to the discussions with you this week. Take care.